Over 2 billion tons of waste are generated by humanity every single year. Of that mountain, nearly 20% is glass. What makes that number even more staggering is the time scale. A single glass bottle buried in a landfill won't break down in a decade or a century or even in thousands of years. Scientists estimate it could sit unchanged for over a million years. That's practically forever. But unlike plastics or paper, there's a twist in glass's story. It doesn't have to end as trash. Glass is one of the rare materials that can be recycled endlessly without losing clarity, purity, or strength. A bottle can be melted, reformed, and used again, 10 times, 100 times, 1,000 times, without ever wearing out. So how exactly does that work? How do piles of dirty, shattered shards get reborn as flawless new bottles? To find out, we step into one of the world's largest glass recycling plants, where hundreds of tons of bottles are brought back to life every single day. Catching bottles at the source. The first requirement is supply. Without a steady stream of empties, no recycling system can function. But collecting clean bottles isn't as simple as it sounds. In many places, used glass is tossed in the trash alongside food scraps and plastics. By the time it reaches sorting facilities, it's a messy, expensive process to separate. That's why Europe has led the way in building smart systems that solve the problem at the start. Across major cities, you'll find reverse vending machines. You finish your beer or soda, drop the empty into the slot, and the machine instantly scans and sorts it. Then, with a satisfying clink, it spits out a refund, usually 10 to 20 cents per bottle. In that moment, a worthless empty turns into something valuable. Suddenly, people don't throw bottles away. They collect them. Some even gather discarded bottles from sidewalks and return them for extra cash. The factories benefit too. Instead of random trash bags, they get streams of bottles that are already pre-sorted, relatively clean and far more consistent. It's a system that works beautifully. And it raises the question, why isn't the US already doing this at scale? Some states have bottle deposit programs, but nationwide America still lags far behind. What do you think? Should we copy Europe's approach? Drop a comment. From streets to storage bays, once reverse vending machines or collection bins fill up, specialized trucks make their rounds. Forklifts hoist massive plastic containers, each holding thousands of bottles and load them onto flatbeds. A single full-size truck can haul 20,000 to 30,000 bottles in one trip, equal to about 10 to 12 tons of glass. Those trucks drive directly to the recycling plant, sometimes carrying tens of thousands of bottles per load. At the facility, the driver backs up to a storage bay and tips the entire haul. In just minutes, a cascade of glass crashes down, forming glittering mountains of green, brown, and clear. Under the lights, the piles sparkle like jewels. But this isn't waste anymore. This is raw material, the lifeblood of the entire operation. Feeding the recycling line front end loaders the size of small houses, scoop up bucketfuls of bottles and dump them into the plant's feed hoppers. From there, gravity takes over. A steel conveyor comes to life with a roar, carrying streams of glass shards and sand into the heart of the factory. The first stop is the vibrating screen. The entire surface shakes violently, forcing out tiny grit, dust, and soil that ride along with the bottles. This early step strips away what's too small or too dirty to matter. After this point, the glass stream looks cleaner, though contaminants still remain. Sorting by hand, still essential. Along the line, workers stand at stations, eyes locked on the belt. Even with advanced machines, human attention still matters. Paper, plastic scraps, and random trash get plucked out by hand. That quick intervention ensures that the downstream process runs smoother and that only glass, nothing else, heads toward the next stage. By now, the material is nearly ready. But one hidden contaminant still lurks among the shards. Bottle caps. Magnets. That do the dirty work. Most caps are made of steel, which makes them easy to remove with brute force physics. A magnetic separator mounted above the conveyor creates a powerful field. Instantly, caps and steel flex leap upward, sticking to the magnet and dropping into a separate bin. The glass keeps rolling. Thanks to this step, the stream is already about 80% clean. In just a few minutes, what was a chaotic mess of bottles and trash has become a feedstock ready for its most critical transformation. Into the hammer mill hole, bottles aren't efficient to recycle. 
They take too long to melt, and they clog furnaces. That's why the glass is crushed down into what the industry calls cullet, tiny fragments that look like man-made sand. A hammer mill the size of a shipping container handles the task. Inside, high-speed rotating hammers smash glass again and again, until nothing larger than a pebble remains. If a chunk slips through too big, sensors catch it and send it back for another round. The result is cullet, sparkling grains that melt much faster than raw sand or limestone. Using cullet saves up to 40% of the energy compared to melting brand new raw materials. On a factory scale, that difference translates to enormous savings in fuel and emissions. Air knives and optical eyes. Once pulverized, the cullet still isn't perfect. Tiny bits of paper labels and foil cling to the fragments. To clear them, the stream passes under a blast of high-pressure air, an air knife that blows away anything lightweight. Paper sails off to one side. Pure glass falls straight through. Then comes the most precise system in the entire line. Optical sorting. As the cullet falls in a shimmering curtain, laser sensors scan tens of thousands of pieces every single minute. In real time, they detect color and composition. If a green shard shows up in a batch meant for clear glass, a micro puff of air fires, knocking it into the correct bin. Ceramics, which don't melt properly, are flagged instantly and removed. The accuracy is astonishing. By the time the cullet leaves the stage, it has been sorted by color with near-perfect precision. Stockpiling for the next life. At the end of the line, three rivers of cullet tumble into massive storage bays, clear, amber, and green. Over hours, the piles grow into mountains, each one holding enough material to produce millions of bottles. This cullet won't sit for long. Soon it will be blended with fresh raw materials. Silica sand for clarity, soda ash to lower the melting point, limestone for stability. Depending on the recipe, cullet makes up anywhere from 20% to 70% of the batch. Every percentage point matters. Adding just 10% more cullet can reduce furnace energy use by around 3% and cut CO2 emissions significantly. Preparing for the fire with the recipe ready, the cullet blend is carried toward the furnace. On its own, it looks like pale, glittering sand, but what's about to happen will transform it into something molten, dense, and alive. The furnace ahead roars at over 1,250 degrees Celsius, hotter than volcanic lava. Workers in fireproof suits prepare the charge, monitoring controls and flow rates. Within hours, the shards will melt into liquid glass, glowing white and heavy as lava. But before we step into the fire, remember what we've just seen tens of thousands of bottles. Once waste, now reduced to cullet, purified by air, magnet, and light, sorted by color, and piled high in waiting bays. This is where the second life of glass begins. The furnace awakens. By the time cullet leaves the storage bays, it is no longer trash. It is fuel for one of the hottest industrial processes on Earth. The next stop is the furnace, a chamber so hot it can melt solid rock. Inside, temperatures soar to 1,250 degrees Celsius, hotter than molten lava spilling from a volcano. The roaring fire doesn't rest. It burns around the clock, every day of the year, devouring truckloads of cullet and raw ingredients in a continuous flow. Each batch is a carefully measured recipe. Silica sand for clarity, soda ash to lower melting temperature, limestone to stabilize, and cull it anywhere from 20 to 70% of the mix to accelerate melting. Every grain is weighed, mixed, and checked before it enters the inferno. 24 hours of heat and pressure. The transformation doesn't happen in an instant. Once inside the furnace, the batch undergoes a slow, controlled metamorphosis. The cullet melts first, turning to liquid almost immediately while grains of raw sand gradually soften, fuse, and disappear into the glowing mass. Gases bubble upward and burn away. Bubbles collapse. Impurities rise and are skimmed off. It takes nearly 24 hours of this relentless heat before the batch becomes fully molten glass, thick, glowing, and free of flaws. At this stage, the glass looks alive, a shimmering lake of liquid fire ready to be shaped. Crucibles that contain chaos. Holding back this glowing mass are crucibles lined with refractory materials that can withstand nearly 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit. These containers must resist not only the heat but also the corrosive nature of molten glass. 
A single crack could shut down an entire line, so workers monitor every surface. Approaching the furnace requires heavy fireproof suits, visors, and gloves. The radiant heat alone is enough to sear exposed skin instantly. Technicians watch carefully, adjusting fuel, oxygen, and flow to maintain the perfect viscosity. If the glass is too thick, it won't form properly. Too thin, and it loses structural strength. Balance is everything, from sand to liquid light. Once stabilized, the mixture no longer resembles its past. What entered as jagged shards and powdered minerals has fused into a single glowing substance. The liquid glass radiates with such brilliance it looks like molten sunlight, shimmering with orange, white, and red. For the next five hours, the molten mass is held steady, giving gases time to escape. Only when the liquid reaches perfect purity does the plant move to the next step, shaping. Designing the mold before molten glass can take form, molds must be ready. This is where digital precision meets centuries-old craft. Engineers use CAD software to design molds accurate to fractions of a millimeter. Every contour of a bottle, the neck, the body, the base, is calculated in advance. A misstep in design could ruin entire production runs. The molds themselves are forged from cast iron or alloy steel, materials capable of handling 1,400 degrees Celsius heat without deforming. They are polished, coated, and tested before installation on the production line. The gob drop. The molten glass doesn't flow freely onto the floor. Instead, it is cut into glowing pieces called gobs. Each gob, weighing just the right amount for a single bottle or jar, drops from the furnace into the waiting molds below. At around 1,011 degrees Celsius, these glowing chunks of glass have the perfect viscosity for shaping. Not too fluid, not too stiff. The double blow process. The first mold in the line is the blank mold. Here, compressed air is blown into the gob, inflating it outward until it clings to the walls. The result is a rough hollow called a parison, a glowing bubble of glass that hints at the final product. Still burning red hot, the parison is transferred to the finishing mold just a few inches away. Another powerful jet of air blasts inside, expanding the parison until it presses firmly against every curve of the mold cavity. In seconds, a bottle has taken shape, neck, shoulders, and body formed with absolute precision. This double blow method is the backbone of modern hollow glass manufacturing. It guarantees consistency, strength, and speed, qualities that keep the world's supply of bottles flowing. A dance of perfect timing. What looks simple is anything but. Every nozzle, valve, and piston on the line is synchronized down to a thousandth of a second. If air pressure comes too soon or too late, the bottle collapses. If the gob is even slightly off in size, the mold won't close properly. And yet, at full speed, hundreds of bottles are created every single minute. Factories can produce hundreds of thousands of bottles per day, each nearly identical, as if cloned from a single mold. The scale is mind-bending. Red hot bottles in formation. Freshly blown bottles glow with the color of hot metal, their surfaces shimmering like molten rods. They emerge from the molds and are carefully placed onto conveyors by robotic arms. The sight is hypnotic. Rows of glowing bottles moving in perfect formation, sliding forward toward the next critical stage. Still fragile from the heat, they must be cooled slowly and evenly, or they risk shattering on the spot. The annealing leer. This is where the annealing leer comes in. It's a long, tunnel-like oven that gradually reduces the temperature of the bottles. At first, the environment remains hot enough to keep the glass pliable, relieving internal stress. Then, inch by inch, zone by zone, the temperature drops. The cooling process may take several minutes, or stretch into tens of minutes for certain bottles. By the time they exit, the fiery red glow has faded into the clear transparency of finished glass. What emerges is not only stable, but strong enough to survive filling, capping, shipping, and years of use. Cameras that never blink. Even after cooling, every bottle faces rigorous inspection. High-speed cameras scan each one as it passes. Cracks, scratches, bubbles, or warps are identified instantly. Defects are rare, but when they appear, the system flags them and removes the bottles from the line. These rejects aren't wasted. They are crushed back into cullet and reintroduced into the recycling loop, ready for another attempt. The neck test. 
The bottle's mouth is its most critical feature. Any flaw here, chipped edges, misaligned dimensions, invisible cracks, can compromise the seal once it's capped. Automated systems rotate each bottle, scanning with optical sensors and mechanical probes. Only those that pass perfectly are allowed to move forward. Building pallets by the thousands. Approved bottles head toward palletizing. Robotic arms equipped with suction cups lift entire rows at once, lowering them gently onto wooden pallets. Between each layer, sheets are placed to prevent impact damage. Once stacked, an automated wrapper spins around the pallet, securing it with plastic film. A barcode is applied, linking every bottle to its production batch. In just minutes, thousands of bottles are stacked, wrapped, and ready for storage. From red heat to global cargo, these pallets don't sit long. Trucks and shipping containers carry them across countries and continents. Within weeks, bottles born from recycled glass can be filled with soda in Mexico, beer in Germany, or wine in Italy. The reach is global. Each one may weigh less than a pound, but together, shipments of bottles amount to tens of thousands of tons of glass moving through global trade networks every day. The scale that keeps growing. Pause to consider the scale. A single factory can recycle hundreds of tons of glass daily. A single truck can haul 30,000 bottles at once. A furnace can melt glass at 1,250 degrees Celsius for 24 hours straight without stopping. Multiply those figures across dozens of plants, and the result is staggering. Billions of bottles reborn every year, powered by a cycle that, in theory, never has to end. Transition to the next stage. The process has taken us from cullet to molten glass, from molten glass to glowing bottles, and from glowing bottles to stable, flawless containers stacked on pallets. But the story isn't finished. The true test of glass comes when those empty bottles reach bottling plants, where they're cleaned, filled, capped, labeled, and sent into the world. That's where the final act of glass recycling begins, from factory floor to filling line. By the time the pallets of bottles leave the furnace hall, they are no longer waste or raw material. They're flawless containers waiting for purpose. Most head straight for bottling plants, where automation transforms them from empty vessels into products recognized around the globe. The first stop is cleaning. Even though these bottles were freshly made, everyone is blasted with high-pressure hot water and steam to ensure that no dust or microscopic particles remain. 